Thank you very much. Um, Alan reminds me I'll have to keep my titles and my books a little bit shorter in the future. Um, it's a great privilege and a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very grateful for the society to uh, offer the opportunity to come up and share some of my thoughts, interests and excitement um, about Piltdown with you. My partner Helen and I have been here since Friday and we've been sampling many of the delights of Edinburgh, including the whiskey trails. Uh, my big discovery for the weekend is Ardberg, and we'll be taking some bottles of that home. But uh, some other discoveries that are of import from a, cent a century ago is the Piltdown. The Piltdown discovery, which was first announced to the world on December the 18th at the Geological Society, where for the first time the world at least learned of the discovery of a new human ancestor, something which in 1912 was very badly needed indeed, and I'll explain some of that as we go along. A little bit of background to begin with. Um, I suppose 1912 could be described as a, a very busy year, but I suppose historians will say that every year is pretty busy, really. Um, in Southampton, we're much exercised by the Titanic and its sinking. 1912, of course, saw Falcon Scott already on his ill-fated journey um, to the Poles. Internationally, Dr. Sun Yat-sen was beginning the uh, process and in 1912 indeed established the Republic of China, sweeping away the old Manchu dynasty. This man's face you may not be familiar with. Um, his name may not be familiar to you, Albert Wagner. He was uh, a geologist, but today every school child will know of his discoveries because we call them plate tectonics, and they were first put forward in 1912. Also in 1912, as this picture in this illustrates, the very first multidisciplinary, inter-institutional, Paleolithic excavation took place between the British Museum and the presence of um, Reginald Smith and Henry Dew of the, uh, of the Geological Survey. And it was the, first, the, very, the very, very first uh, multidisciplinary expedition to look at Paleolithic archaeology, to excavate it in a scientific manner, and to present those details in a new and scientific way. So it's a, very, it's a year in which a considerable amount happened. Um, as Alan says, I have interest in um, literature as well and science fiction. Um, 1912 was a good year for that, possibly on the back of the uh, political events in China. Sachs Roma's eponymous hero, or villain Fu Manchu, was first published. One of the best science fiction stories ever written, The Princess of Mars, saw first publication in book form, and a world publishing phenomenon from the same author, Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tarzan of the Apes, possibly only equaled by the Harry Potter series um, of today. These two have a great deal of interest as far as human evolution is concerned, and one of the things that's always interested me is how much human evolution filters into literature, and how much literature then influences the public perception of human evolution. And as, uh, uh, as Alan said, one of, the, one of the main themes of the book that I've just written is about that. Uh, Piltdown was a discovery set against an international background. The British Empire at that time was probably at its largest, at least in terms of um, you know, conquest uh, area, and what, um, land area, um, since the loss of the Americas in the 1770s. The international aspect for Piltdown was set against a rivalry between the British and other uh, imperial powers in Europe who had very active archaeological interests of their own. The Great Romans, the French, although they had been our allies since 1904, um, as you can see here from the Dordogne Valley, had an exquisite series of archaeological sequences providing different cultures sequentially over time. And any number of fossils, uh, here at La Chapelle au Somme of 1908, um, this set up in the 30s, which is supposedly indicating sort of Neanderthal man's appearance, um, just demonstrating how important to the French their discoveries were. The Germans, of course, they had plenty as well. Here, the original Neander fossil, and even the Mara mandible of, 19, uh, of 1908, were different species of fossil human. Even the Belgians had them. <laughs> how bad was it going to get? And unfortunately, the British didn't have anything that was quite as good, and we certainly didn't have anything that was as well publicised. What we did have was a series of skeletons which had considerable doubt surrounding them. So, for example, the Foxhall Road um, jaw, the Gallagher skeleton found in the 1880s and only published in the 1890s, 
and the Ipswich skeleton of 1911. The problem was that these were all much later intrusive burials into more ancient Pleistocene Stone Age sediments. So they're actually Neolithic or later prehistoric. And people at the time were saying this, but a great many of the British academics and the English academics didn't want to believe this because these were really the best option we had to match our imperial rivals on the continent. We also had some other uh, assets. One of them was this man, Sir Arthur Keith, who was, by his own description, the greatest living comparative anatomist of his time. <laughs> so imperial ambition and imperial egotism mixed up there. Um, and Arthur Keith was supporting a, a new theory at the time, which was considered very modern. And that theory was that modern human bodies had evolved very, very early on. And you can see from this diagram from his Antiquity of Man, published in 1915, that the Pleistocene, the, the Ice Age, uh, was then considered about 400,000 years old. And the Pliocene, the geological era that preceded it, um, another 500,000 years older on top of that. Here's the marble races as they were seen in those days. They had very deep origins, according to Sir Arthur Keith. But below that, the modern human body form was very ancient. He said it began sometime here in the Pliocene. So we can take the Arthur Keith perspective of bodies before brains as being a very modernist, very, uh, very influential and advanced view for the era of Piltdown itself. And it was rivaled by a much older perspective, and that was that brains advanced before bodies, so the opposite of what Arthur Keith was saying. And that's quite well epitomized by this, which is a reproduction from 1900 of Pithecanthropus erectus, you know, I can't say, Pithecanthropus erectus, the Java man, discovered in the early 1890s by the Dutch Eugene de Bois. See, he went to the Dutch had stuff and we didn't. Oh, God, terrible. Um, and this epitomizes quite nicely the idea of brains evolving before bodies. If you look at this, it's an amalgamation of different features, some human, some ape. You can see the toes, uh, very ape-like, the split, the, the gap between the, foot, the big toe and the other toes. You can see the long forearms here, the very long fingers for grasping trees. And yet, if you look at the expression on this, it's almost wistful as it stares at the tool. Um, I don't know if it's contemplating suicide or not, I'm never quite sure. This was created for the Paris exhibition in 1900, but it nicely shows the difference between the brains for bodies or, or the bodies for brains, these two different rival um, interpretations. Piltdown is set very, very much in this brains before bodies uh, type of interpretation, as opposed to the Arthur Keith, the more modernist one. So already in terms of the development and idea behind the forgery, it's clear that the forger was attempting to go to much older viewpoints and support those by providing a fossil ancestor which fitted this picture. Okay, then let's think about the Piltdown forgery itself. Piltdown was discovered by this man, Charles Dawson. He was a solicitor from Uxfield, Uxfield sorry, in, uh, in Sussex. And he had been a long-time collector for the Natural History Museum, as it is today, the British Museum of Natural History, as it was in those days. And he was a collecting colleague of this man, Sir Arthur Smith Woodward. That's Dawson actually standing behind him. Smith Woodward was, at this time, probably the world's greatest authority on fossil fish. Uh, not only by his measure, but by other people as well. He uh, also felt that he was qualified, therefore, to look at any fossil. And indeed, his track record of publication shows that he went into all kinds of fossil discoveries um, and interpreted them. Here is Pardon, Eanthropus Dorsoni, Dawson's Man of the Dawn. It's very often considered that the Piltdown forgery is just about this particular uh, uh, set of fossils, but it's not. The Piltdown forgery was an attempt to foist an entire world upon the scientific community, because it's not just the, fo the, the fossil itself. It's the material culture, the things that this, that this creature is supposed to have made. It's the animals that it lived with. It's the antecedents of that world 
that were also artificially forged, and indeed the descendants of that world that were artificially forged. So it was a complete package of an ancestor, the time it came from, the time before it, and the time after it. And that's something that's often missed in a lot of the literature nowadays. So when we were first heard of the Piltdown forgery uh, by letter, they tried to meet up, they, uh, Smith Willard tried to go down and to visit Sussex, to, uh, to go and Dawson visit the site, but things didn't work out, Dawson got a bit fed up, and at the end of May on the 24th, he walked into Smith Woodward's office and he put the fossils down onto the desk in front of him, and he said, how's that for Heidelberg? In other words, he was saying, this is very similar to the Heidelberg man job from Germany. From that moment on, the Piltdown forgery is in play. We know which bits those are, and we know that they were fraudulently stained. So irrespective of whether or not Charles Dawson is the author of the forgery, that's irrelevant. I'm not going to talk about who did the forgery today. But from that moment on, the forgery was actively in play. Right, let's think a little bit more about it. So, from uh, May up until the beginning of June, um, there's a lot of backwards and forwards correspondence, and in June, the team go into the field and they begin to excavate. And here they are digging. You can see some of the diggings behind them. Um, there was only three or four individuals involved in the digging full time. Here's Charles Dawson, digging away scientifically with his pick. There's Sir Arthur Smith Woodward. This was a local man called Venus Hargreaves, who was the uh, sort of local guy that they hired just to do what, the heavy laboring. And this is a goose called Chipper. <laughs> Chipper appears in a lot of the photographs. I know some very senior colleagues from the Natural History Museum who are convinced that Chipper had a bigger role to play than has previously been considered. That the mastermind behind the forgery may not even have been human. Well, they really want me to, uh, to <laughs> say their names out loud, but I will after a few drowns. Uh, during, the, during the field season in 1912, it wasn't the field season as we would think of it, you know, they didn't go out and spend three weeks digging. They went at weekends, they went at uh, odd, you know, odd times when they could grab a Sunday here or a bank holiday or something like that. The majority of the pieces that were not given to Smith Woodward on the day that Dawson walked into the office are found, therefore, in this first field season. And we have animal teeth and bones, there are more skull fragments, critically the jewels found, and there are stone tools as well, two varieties, eoliths and paleoliths, and I'll come on to describe those um, in a minute. So this first field season is a key one, because this one is where loads of the really important finds are made, and bits actually fit back onto things that were found uh, prior to this, Bear Dawson, allegedly. What wasn't, what, what wasn't in the original discoveries, but was found in this first field season, was the jaw. And the jaw was a critical part of the forger's game plan. The jaw is very primitive looking. It has this huge ascending ramus, uh, which is the articulation up here, which fits into the, uh, into the skull. <clears throat> but the, but the eye tooth, the canine, was not found. There were two layers still in place, and the layers were very flat. In fact, the forger had filed them down. This wasn't discovered until the 1950s. That flat wear is a very human characteristic. And what the forger was doing was producing evidence to say that the way that the Piltdown man chewed was a very modern way of chewing, even though it had a very ape-like jaw. And as we know nowadays, it was probably an orangutan jaw. The absence of the canine, though, was critical because the canine could only be a certain type of canine. It couldn't be too big, because if it was, it would interfere with the side-to-side -side movement of the jaw, which would make the flat chewing. But it would still have to be ape-like in some respects, otherwise it wouldn't fit in with a primitive-looking jaw. They went to, um, to bat on this, they tried to reconstruct it, and here are Smith, Woodward, and Dawson reconstructing it. There's an early version of the reconstruction. And here, this yellow version is the very first version that Arthur Smith Woodward created. And you can see there's the canine modeled in the absence of the canine based on what they thought it would be like. And you can see there later on, they put it, they put it back in a second reconstruction. So on the 18th of December, they present this to the world. And the world now has a brand new human ancestor. 
And there was a huge furor in the press. Um, it was a great cause celeb um, of the time. But even from that first moment, things began to go wrong. And they began to go wrong quite badly. Furthermore, people in the audience disputed whether the fact that the jaw, very primitive, but the brain case, very advanced, could actually be part of the same animal. People thought, well, it couldn't be. These things had to be very, very different. They couldn't be part of the same animal. They didn't believe that the stone tools were associated with the Piltdown. They began to interpret them in very different ways, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later on. They explained they interpreted them as hand axes, which was the very last thing that Charles, Charles Dawson, as the um, project archaeologist, wanted. Arthur Keith, not to be outdone by Smith Woodward's reconstruction, here is Smith Woodward's reconstruction. He got casts, he broke the casts apart, and he reconstructed the skull and the jaw in his own way. And this is it. And this slide nicely shows the difference between the brains before bodies and the bodies before brains. So the, the Arthur Smith Woodward older version and the Arthur Keith more modernist version. It's the same set of skull plates and the same set of bones, but reconstructed with preconception playing a great part in the reconstruction of it. And you can see the difference. I mean, he's added things like a chin, for which there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever, making it more modern looking. So I like to think of the forger, possibly Dawson, uh, possibly not, going home that night on the 18th of December 1912. He's in a railway carriage, the rain's trickling down the side, and he's staring morosely out, and he's thinking, what the hell went wrong? How did these people start thinking for themselves? I gave them a clear-cut forgery, and they just completely misinterpreted it. Academics will do that kind of thing. Academics think for themselves. It's very, very irritating. So, from the moment the forgery is announced, there's a lot of controversy surrounding it. And of course, one of the things that they'll need in order to sort that controversy out, or at least some of it, is to find a canine tooth. If they can find a canine tooth, that will say which one of these two is probably the most accurate reconstruction. So in 1913, Smith, Woodward and Dawson go back into the field, and guess what they find? Yeah, they find the canine tooth, and there it is, back in there. And it's perfect. It's absolutely, almost pinpoint perfection for what Smith Woodward would have reconstructed it as. Yes, it is primitive and pointy looking, but no, it doesn't stick up too much. Um, it allows the side-to-side -side movement of the jaw. Everything's fine. So, the Smith Woodward reconstruction of Eothropus of Dorsona now seems to gain the upper hand. Arthur Keith kind of accepts it, but he's still grumbling a lot about it. So 1913, an important season for, in terms of the forger, putting the forgery back on track for where the forger wanted it to be originally. And then, as the second field season of 1913 develops, Dawson announces he's found something new. In my opinion, the opinion of other people as well, who said it before I have, uh, this was intended to be the next stage of the forgery. This is the Barkham Mills remains. And there are some pieces of the frontal bone, which is this part of the skull up here, the zygomatic arch, which is the cheek arch here, um, and a molar. Dawson tells Smith Woodward that he's found this in another area close by Piltdown. The bones are not as thick. In his opinion, this is a descendant of the Anthropus. So this is a descendant of the Piltdown man. We know that these are also parts of the forgery. Why? Because they're artificially stained as well. And when the British Museum had a look at this in the 1950s, they found plenty of evidence for artificial forgery in terms of this. For some reason, and we've never, know, we've never known why, Smith Woodward didn't bite on this. He wasn't interested. He was still focused on the main Piltdown One site. And so they had to go back. The problem was, as far as the forgery was concerned, they dug the hell out of the site. There were pits everywhere, there was very little they could now go and dig in a new way, in undisturbed ground, that would provide a you know, fruitful area for the forger to actually plant new artificially um, uh, introduced material. So the forger's a bit stuck at this point, and it comes out in 1914 with this, the cricket bat. And when you look at it, you, you, know, you have to think, this is a stupid forgery. I mean, this is stunningly thick. All right? Today, we look at this, and we think, how the hell can you expect people would accept this? It's, 
It's a big slab of elephant bone. It's been artificially carved by a metal knife at one end and then stained fraudulently in the same way as the main Piltdown remains were stained. It wasn't even found in the pit. It was found under the hedge. <laughs> <laughs> and what they said was, oh, boy, the guys had been digging up the pit the very first time that Dawson walked past and, and saw the fact that there was all this um, uh, gravel there that he'd never realised before. They must have found this cricket back then, had a look at it, chucked it beside the edge of the hedge, and then just kind of chucked more spoil on top of it, and then forgotten about it. So yeah, right from the very beginning, the cricket bat just, just stands out as being this kind of spectacularly odd piece um, of forgery, and yet it was accepted. The scientific community accepted it, and um, I'll explain a little bit why uh, in a while. By 1915, things had gone uh, more awry, really, for Piltdown. There were still arguments about whether or not the jaw and the skull are part of the same animal. Arthur Keith is still unhappy about whether or not the reconstruction is accurate. And in 1915, Dawson writes to Smith Woodward and says, oh, hey, guess what I found? I found something else. Amazing. Brilliant. I found another piece of Ian Philippus Dawsonite. I found a second Piltdown man, and I found it at a site very close to the original Piltdown. It's not the same place, but it's slightly further on, at a place called Sheffield Park. There's even a mirror filed down in exactly the same way. It's likely that this is part of the original skull that the forger didn't use in the first presentation, and part of the original dentition um, as well. For some reason, Smith Woodward doesn't bite again. He will not take this up. He's focused on that very first Piltdown site, which is a bit confusing now, um, and the forger, I think, is a bit stuck with what to do. By 1916, there's a final field season, Charles Dawson is ill, and he dies that year. He doesn't join the field team. He doesn't join Venus Hargreaves, Chipper, and um, Smith Woodward in the field. And it's significant that the only thing that's found is this big cobble, this cannon shot gravel, which Smith Woodward says is uh, possibly a hammer stone. It's likely it was just an ordinary component of the gravel. It's also significant that it's completely unstained, unlike all the other material from the site which was stained. Excuse me, ma'am. That's really the end of the Piltdown story in terms of the announcements to the public and of discoveries. However, in 1917, Smith, Smith Woodward does announce to the geological discovery the Sheffield Park find. He says that some years ago, my friend Charles Dawson had found this second example of Piltdown, Piltdown Man. And in that sense, the Sheffield Park discovery is a key one because it finally stills the doubters. One example can always be some sort of odd freak or some sort of you know, um, amalgamation of different fossils in, this, in the same place. Two examples at different place, no, statistically that's very unlikely. So in effect, what the Sheffield Park find did was finally still the doubters. Even Arthur Keith himself accepted it. And having accepted it, he went for it overboard. Curiously, from that point on, Sheffield Park, Piltdown 2, and the Barker Mills, the descendant, just recede into the background and are almost forgotten entirely until the late 1940s and the early 1950s. Now, another literary first for that year, and of some interest to those of you here in Edinburgh, was the publication of Conan Doyle's The Lost World. A fantastic book, I'm sure many of you have read it, one of the greatest adventure stories ever written in my opinion. Um, and it's significant for a number of reasons. Obviously Conan Doyle has been fingered as one of the authors of the Piltdown forgery. Spectacularly lack of evidence for that. <laughs> um, but it's interesting because the very, very first mention of Piltdown to Arthur Smith Woodward, prior to Dawson taking the fossils and planting them on his desk and saying, how's that for Heidelberg, was in the context of this particular novel. Conan Doyle had found flints on his estate at Cobra, which is near Piltdown, um, and he'd asked Smith Woodward to come down and have a look at them, and Smith Woodward had said, I can't, but I'll send my friend Charles Dawson, and Dawson had gone along with his wife, they'd gone to lunch with Conan Doyle's, and Dawson wrote back to Smith Woodward. And this is the very first mention of Piltdown ever. And he says, I've come across a very old Pleistocene bed 
or behind the Hastings bet between Uckfield and Crowborough, which I think is going to be interesting. It has a lot of iron stained flints in it, so I suppose it's the oldest known flint gravel in the world. And then he goes on to say, I have, or I have a thick, I think I have, a portion of the human skull, which will wire well in the of against us in solidity. And then he finishes off, yes, Colonel Brown is writing a sort of Jules Bond book on some wonderful plateau in South America with a log which somehow got isolated from elitic times and contained all the fauna and flora of that period and was visited by the usual professor. I hope someone has sorted out his fossil spring. Well, hopefully not Charles Dawson, I think. One of the reasons why Colonel Brown is simply not a variable uh, um, target for the forgery is that the lost world contains no similarities to the Piltdown forgery whatsoever. This is Harry Rantry's famous reconstruction from the Strand magazine prior to the book publication. And the reconstruction here of looks more like a mischievous elf from Christmas has gone a bit awry. Um, the reconstruction here, there's no similarity whatsoever to the Piltdown man himself. And all of the um, Conan Doyle proofs, uh, uh, as it were, of duplicity and of conspiracy within the forgery, I think, are very, very poor. Uh, but it's interesting, it's within the lost world that the, that the very first announcement for Piltdown occurs. And um, for me, that's going to be interesting, because I'm going to use the lost world as a vehicle to develop uh, some ideas. As I said, in 2006, I published a, a, a critical assessment of the stone tools from the Piltdown forgery, just going on with my interests from Victorian and Edwardian um, science and the history of human origins uh, research. Um, it, it surprised me, and it still surprises me today, that the stone tools have not been looked at for 50 years, despite a voluminous amount of material published on the fossils, and particularly on the skull itself. Um, and I think this is a shame, because there are some very important messages that the stone tools have to tell us about the, uh, the forgery, particularly about what the forger intended. And I think the stone tools tell us five things. Firstly, that the forgery was intended to depict a particular time span. And that time span is the pre chelian and I'll explain what that is um, in a minute. Secondly, the, the whole of the forgery, both the material culture, the stone tools, and the animal itself, the Anthropus dorsoni, and the world it lived in, were intended to demonstrate transition, transition from one state. It was a creature in the process of evolving as well as its material culture. I don't think the forger ever intended the thing to go beyond 1912. The Barker Mills descendant was meant to be the next stage of the forgery, but it simply didn't bite um, as far as Smith Woodward is concerned. People have said, and I completely agree with them, that the 1913 field season, in other words, the canine, is a repair job. The forger intending to put the forgery back on the track where he intended it to be. I don't think it's just the canine. I think the entire 1913 field season demonstrates that. The whole thing was a repair job. And finally, this cricket bat, this really odd piece of forgery, I think is best understood when we look at the forgery in terms of the intention to recreate a pre chelian world. And as I said, um, I'll explore that a little bit uh, and make it a little bit clearer for you. Okay, now let's think about what is this pre chelian well, by 1912, by the time of Piltdown, there was a very sophisticated viewpoint of the Paleolithic. So the Paleolithic had already been developed up into its three basic periods, the upper, the middle, and the lower. And there were cultures, subdivisions within those three basic divisions that you can see here. And at that time, when race was considered to be of great significance, they were even trying to tie up what they saw as the modern races of humans into these different subdivisions, allowing particular periods of time with what they saw as particular racial subdivisions and particular uh, stone tool cultures made by those people. The Lower Paleolithic was the most uh, remote and the oldest and the most mysterious. There were two divisions that were well known, <coughs> excuse me, mostly from French sources, the Asheri, or the Asher, from the basis of uh, nice, flat, ovate hand axes, and the Chelian, the Chelian on the basis of more pointed, earlier, older, crawler looking hand axes. And then we came to what happened before that. 
That was the pre-Chalian world. And the pre-Chalian world was, in my opinion, the lost world. And I use the lost world now as a vehicle to carry this um, idea forward. <coughs> On the continent, there were supposedly two cultures that fitted in, the Strepi and the Mesvignan. Both of them found by a Belgian, which didn't sit well with the British. Uh, the whole of this sequence was found by the French, which didn't sit well with the British either. So this is where kind of, you know, that kind of nationalism thing comes in. Uh, these were highly debated. Some people didn't believe them at all, said it was nonsense, there was no such thing as a streppy culture, there was no such thing as a Mesvinian culture. British archaeologists looked for them in Britain, didn't find them. Uh, a lot of debate about that. But covering this period here, this pre chalian period, what there had been in Britain was two groups of tools, or two cultures if you want to think of them that way. One was called the Eolithic, which was the oldest, and the other was the Rostra Karanet, or Pre-Paleolithic, of East Anglia. This, in a sense, was the British pre chalian Now, the Eoliths were promoted originally by this man, Benjamin Harrison, marvelous character, half mad, half deaf, obsessive compulsive shopkeeper from Item in Kent, and a wonderful man. And he was championed by Joseph Prestwich, one of the great geologists of his time, a hero of 1859 and the establishment of human antiquity. And what the Eoliths were were things that looked like this. They were natural pieces of stone with useful looking concavities or useful points or useful sharp edges. They were found on the surface. And what the supporters of the Eoliths said was that humans in a very, very remote period came along. They recognized the utility of these shapes, picked them up and used them use them to cut with and things like this. Occasionally, they'd enhance those edges with a little bit of retouch. So if they had a concave edge, they'd make it a little more concave with some just some chipping. Or if there was a nice point, they would enhance that point. But effectively, they were very simple, very, very crude tools, as befitting their position in the pre chalian the very earliest period of human cultural evolution. And then slightly later uh, in time, was the, pro, uh, was the uh, Rostra Karanets and the Pre-Paleolithic of East Anglia. This was the discovery of James Reed Moyer, who you see here is a very young man, who, like, uh, like, like Harrison and Prestwich, was championed by Sir Edwin Ray Lancaster, uh, who at that time had retired from his directorship of the Natural History Museum. Uh, Lancaster was a great guy. He was always fighting with somebody. He was a really competitive fellow. You know? And he just saw us an opportunity to have a go at virtually everybody. And he took it, he braced it. Um, and even at times it got so combative that he had to kind of restrain um, Reid Moyer in, who turned out to be even more combative than he was. Uh, and it was largely this very aggressive advocacy of these two that promoted these, again, rather natural looking pieces of stone um, as genuinely made and modified ancient tools. And in a sense, it was these that fitted into the British version of the pre -Chilean. As you can imagine, both were hotly argued about, heavily, heavily disputed. Um, and in meetings like this, we'd end up in fist fights with people arguing, you know, you'd be kind of, no, 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 shouting at me, and I'd be, oh, I can't hear them say that. I mean, it's hard now to think of just how much anger these natural stones did evoking people. Uh, it's been a great time to be an audience in the Royal Society. Brilliant. <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway, thinking about this pre chalian world now, how was it that the Piltdown Flodger delivered the idea of a pre chalian And this is what I think the first of the things that the stone tools tell us. Did it in three ways. Firstly, by presenting a period of time in which you could see evolution occurring within the pre chalian world. He presented species which existed in the Pliocene, the Mastodon and the Stegodon, two elephant types of animal that were extinct by the Pleistocene. He then presented a series of Pleistocene animals which came in after this Pliocene age, uh, animals that, were, that are extant today, such as the hippo, beaver, horse, and things like that. So the first one was by planting specific species to show progression over time. The second thing that he did was to choose specimens which were very damaged. They were very old and very battered. So extinct species whose remains looked like they'd been kicking around in rivers for a very long time indeed. And the more modern ones of the Pleistocene later on didn't have that rolling on them. So he was showing progression over time in doing this. 
and also the staining. These ones were artificially stained by the forger, very, very dark. These ones, less, uh, which were not as old, were stained much lighter. So there was a difference in age and appearance, and the forger was very cleverly bringing these three things together. Even the earlets, these, uh, these natural pieces of stone, were put together um, and placed in with the forgery. Some of them very, very darkly stained, and some of them less so. We don't know whether these elits were artificially stained or not, but what we think the forger did was choose ones that were darker stained and put them in with the Pliocene stuff, and then choose ones that were lighter stained and indicate that they came in with uh, Eanthropus. Eanthropus, the Piltdown man, belonged in the Pleistocene. So the forger very cleverly was creating the idea of progression over time and of an older and a younger age. And this is pretty much what I think he was trying to show. The Pliocene, the stained and worn units, the extinct mammals, and the very stained and worn bones. The time of Piltdown itself, Eanthropus. Some extinct mammals, but the lot of uh, stained, the less stained and uh, unrolled earlets. And then I'll come on to another piece, um, which was less stained, which was less worn, and looked more advanced, a little hand axe looking uh, item. It's called E606 after its museum acquisition number, and I'll show you that one in a minute. So I think what the forger was doing was showing change over time. He was filling in this pre chalian world with a huge span, giving not only the time of the Anthropus, but the time before it, and through E606, the time after it as well. From that very first field season, when they were digging in 1912, there are only three pieces found, right? and these are two of them, okay? E605 and E607. Today we look at these things and we think, my God, what were they thinking of? But remember, these were accepted by some of the great authorities of the world at that time. Can you see the little spot here, picked out by a circle and an arrow? And again, that's where in 1950, the, 1953, the museum authorities from the Natural History Museum in South Kensington began to apply hydrochloric acid and take the stone off, revealing underneath a creamy looking pattern, indicating probably that these are Neolithic surface finds that have been found um, and artificially stained and then artificially planted. In terms of this pre chalian world, the forger was very clever. He took two aspects that were key in terms of selling the idea of these tools as being pre chalian Universal working, and the fact that they were made on flakes. Now, the Chalian were hand axes. Chalian hand axes were bifacially flaked. They were made on two faces, thinning and shaping on two sides. All right? He's saying, look, these are unifacial. They're therefore more primitive. They haven't yet developed the ability to make a bifacial hand axe. Therefore, they fit in the pre Chalian world. Um, on flakes, the Chalian hand axes made by napping on two faces were always made from big cobbles, and they'd flake away on the big cobble until they came out with the bifacial uh, hand axe that they wanted. He's saying, no, they haven't got to that stage yet. They're only making them on the bits that they can knock off. So they universally flake on the bits that come off. They haven't yet evolved to the point where they can make a hand axe on a cobble. And this was key because this was, these were the two reasons that sold these pieces of material culture as being pre chalian as being the, uh, the tools that the Anthropus made. This one is the only one we have provenance information for. E606. It's said to be slightly more advanced. Um, and you can see, in a sense, what the forger has done is choose a natural piece of flint, which is artificially stained, but you can see how pointy it is. It's completely natural, but he's chosen one that looks hand axe shaped, more so than these guys do. Yes, it's on a flake, says Dawson. Yes, it's unifacially worked, says Dawson. But it's more advanced looking, because it looks more triangular. It looks more hand axe like. And they also uh, gave it a provenance. They said it was found higher up in the stratigraphy. So this is more advanced than those two. And again, this is part of that idea of the forger, implanting progression within uh, the Piltdown forger, within the idea of the pre-Chelian. You can also see, 
Can you see here the slightly darker staining with little chips? This is where I think the uh, forger did a bit of foot napping to enhance that idea of triangularness. Because what's happened here is the fresh flake surface has absorbed the artificial stain that the, that the forger has applied differentially. You can see here, here's the creamy surface. There's the, uh, well, there's the surface once the HCL has taken off the artificial stain. But here, where the little napping occurred by the forger, um, it's very fresh and it's absorbed the stain, the artificial stain differentially. So the new 606 is a real killer in terms of this idea of progression within the pre chelian world. And that's what was trying to be promoted by the forger in 1912. He gives the stratigraphy and he gives it, um, it when you read it back, he gives it in quite a detailed way. When you read it for the first time, it's very confusing. And that's one of the problems of Charles Dawson as a writer, is he's never very clear. He doesn't, doesn't do himself any favours whatsoever in terms of selling his message. And this may be part of the reason why these academics began to think for themselves. The last part of the gravel had all the mammals, had Eothropus itself, had uh, the two handle, the two sort of pre chelian artefacts came from there. And then E606 was found higher up here. So the stratigraphy is being used as a mechanism to also demonstrate progression within the pre chelian world, in my opinion. Okay, so that's the first thing that I think that the stone tools tells us. The second thing, as I think you'll appreciate now from what I've just been saying, is that the whole of the Piltdown floor tree is intended to demonstrate progression over time. He's filling up the pre chelian world with an evolving hominid. And that's something the French don't have, the Belgians don't have, and the Germans don't have. They don't have evolution, a clear demonstration of a single evolving lineage over time. And that's what Dawson, oh, that's what the forger is presenting, not only in the material culture, in the tools that the Anthropus makes, but in the Anthropus itself. So I think that's the second thing that the tools give us an insight into. The third thing is that I don't think the forger ever intended the thing to go on beyond 1912. If you look at the, the finds, first of all, here we've got 1912 and pre-1912, large number of finds, big boats, lots of refitting portions, um, all looks great. 1913, repair job. It's the camera and there's uh, and some tools I'll show you in a minute, okay? And it's just that stuff. Very scrappy bits otherwise, fragments of jewels and tooth. The cricket bat year, 1914, that's almost all that's found. A few more scraps, a few more bits, almost certainly part of the original forgery, um, with the forger simply using up bits that are left over. Um, then you've got that odd hammerstone thing uh, here in 1916. So you can see, not only from the frequency of finds, but from the character and the nature of the finds. I think it's clear that 1913 is meant as a repair job, 1912 it was all meant to end, and the forger wanted to move things on to the descendant, to the Barker Mills discovery. But as we said, for some reason Smith Woodward simply didn't bite on that. So we come to the 1913 season itself, the salvage operation. And here we're presented with some very specific finds. Finds that are not allowing us to make our own mind up. Finds that make it very clear what it was that the forger um, intended. Here's one of the only two stone tools that were published from that season. A triangular flake of paleolithic outline, but having eolithic edge chipping. Uh, about the apex, the colour and patination resembling those of the Eolithic forms found in the pit generally. So it's a transitional piece. It's not a Paleolith, it's not an Eolith, it's a bit of both. And again, this odd piece, a flaked flint showing few flakings on one face, unifacial. A simple flake on the other, in other words he's saying it's a flake, it's not a Chilean bifacial piece. And it's tabular shape uh, in edge view. So they're being told very clearly what to think about these pieces. He could have planted another E606. He could have planted eoliths. He could have planted uh, rostrocarinus. He could have planted anything. But no, just these two. And we're told very, very clearly what it is that we should be thinking about them. What he didn't plant, I think, in that sense, is very instructional. 
1914, canine, those two fronts, the stratigraphy is, um, is clarified enormously. We're now told that all the remains come from the base of the sequence here. It's implied that the two flints found in 1912 came from here. And there was a hiatus, in other words, a break in deposition. There's a period of time that unrecorded between this and this. And E606 is said to be in this higher layer. So the stratigraphy has now been clarified in order to demonstrate this progression of time, this evolution through the pre chelian period. So I think the stone tools give us a very, very clear insight into what it was the theatre intended from uh, the 1913 season as well. And this brings us on to the cricket bat. This very bizarre, odd piece, or a stupid piece of forgery, found underneath the hedge, not in anywhere uh, near proximity to the pit from which the material was coming from. And I think that this actually makes much better sense in terms of a pre chelian world than any of the other interpretations that have been presented for it. Uh, an old friend and colleague of mine, Andy Current, from the Natural History Museum, has said that what this thing is, is actually a warning. It's such a curious, such an odd, such a silly forgery. That what he's, uh, Andy says is happening is that someone has rumbled the forgery. And they planted this deliberately to say, hang on a minute, mate, stand back, come on, come on, it's all up, move it on. And what the forger did was turn it on its head and say, look what I found. Amazing. Which is very true. It's a really, really brave and very nice um, st stitch up. You can see from the, the you can see the cut marks with the of the metal knives that were made to uh, create the handle. And indeed, it does actually look quite cricket bat like at the end here, simply being you know carved. In. And who says you know the earliest Englishman, the earliest cricket bat? Who knows? Um, it was certainly accepted as such, and as I say, some of, the, some of the most significant authorities of the time took it on board, no problem. I think it makes much more sense in terms of thinking about the pre-Chelian world. So if we think of the Chelian as being this period of time of the gravel, and we're going from a transitional animal moving up through to E606, right? This is from a pre-pre-chelian pre time. It was actually from the base here. What happened was the forger took bits of yellow sand and mud and rubbed them into the cracks. So it was clear what the context of this piece was. And he faked these two things, which are fragments of bone, stuck onto yellow sand, the same yellow sand as from the bottom here, and then glued them onto a piece of, um, of iron stone and then artificially stained that as well. So he was creating a context for this cricket bat. And the context was that it came before everything. At the time, there was some talk that before the age of stone, before a Paleolithic, a pre chelian there was an age of wood or bone, an organic tool age prior to a stone tool age. And I think that's what the cricket bat, bat actually fits into best as an interpretation. This, I think, is then how it actually works out. The forger didn't intend this. The forger was reacting to circumstance. His idea of the forgery evolved after 1912 in order to fit changing circumstances. And what he did was think, oh, I know, I need to keep Arthur Smith Woodward interested. There's no way else we can look. I'll think of something like a uh, proof of an organic age of tools prior to a stone tool age. And this is how I think ultimately the forger came to think of his own work. An organic and bone tool age in the Pliocene, and then to the latest Pliocene, or the beginning of the Ice Age, the Anthropus, and then the fix of 1912, 1913, those ones that are said to be transitional, that there can be no argument about. The other ones that were found the previous year, the unifacial ones on flakes, then I think E606 finally into the Chelian, filling out the whole of the pre Chelian world. This is the idea of the brains before bodies, the older interpretation that was against Arthur Keith. But of course, one of the problems there is the Elis. Now, the Elis don't really fit into this sequence at all. And it's interesting that in 1915, Charles Dawson launches a devastating attack on Elis. Not only on the Kentish elites, but also on the elites of the, uh, the pre-plateau, the pre-Paleolithic, 
Buster Karnitz of Reed Meyer and of Edwin Ray Lancaster. And he annihilates them. Um, he also comes out with an absolutely ridiculous view, view or a new interpretation of the formation of flint and the formation of fracture within flint, which uh, everybody thought was utterly ridiculous. But nonetheless, it was a devastating attack. And in a sense, it actually makes sense. If you want to promote this, Elis don't fit. There's just no place for them in that kind of a progression. Because what the forger wanted was his version of things, and not something like this, which just made that progression uh, messy. Now, some people have argued that the cricket bat is actually a forgery intended to show up Arthur Smith Woodward. Here he is. Smith Woodward is said to have been a man who believed in the elites. Smith Woodward is said to be a man who believed in an organic age of bone tools prior to the uh, beginning of stone. Now, I have looked into this. Now, over the last few months, I've been going into the literature and reading Smith Woodward's work. And I can find absolutely no evidence of this whatsoever. In all of his publications, he very, very rarely mentions stone tools or eliths at all. During the time of the Piltdown forgery, he doesn't talk about archaeology at all. He doesn't need to. Dawson is his man. You know, he's the project's archaeologist, so he does the talking. After Dawson dies, Smith Woodward does make a couple of uh, comments. In 1919, he publishes a very short piece in Nature called The Antiquity of Man. All right? You'd think, if you're going to mention something you believe in, that would be the vehicle to do it. No mention of them whatsoever. Reed Meyer of the uh, East Anglian pre-period, incensed by this lack of uh, archaeology, writes to the editor of Nature, Sir, I am shocked and disgusted that this, this sort of thing can be published without this reference to very clear and important body of evidence called the Elites. You really, really must do something about this. Um, so, Arthur Smith Willard is invited to reply. He replies with four lines. And he says, I never include chipped flints because they are inconclusive evidence. That's pretty straightforward as far as, as far as I'm concerned. So, there's no evidence in the printed world of Smith Willard having any interest in the elites, really, other than simply accepting that they may have been around, which most others uh, would have done as well. He was a fossil man. That's what, that's what his interest was. One of the things that's always quoted as being evidence of him being a believer in an organic age of bone tools is this article from Nature in 1912 called Paleolithic Man in New Jersey. If you go and look for that article, you won't find it. The reason is it doesn't exist. People have been quoting it and quoting it and quoting it ad nauseum, and they've never gone back and checked their original references. I did the same. <laughs> 2006, I didn't check my references carefully as, as I should have done. And then I said, there's good evidence of that, but I'll add it to this article here. And I thought, uh, for the latest publication, I ought to really go and check my evidence. And to my horror, I found I'd made the same mistake as other people. <laughs> the, the paper actually exists. Oh, okay. The paper actually exists here. It's in the following volume of nature. And it's absolutely nothing to do with organic tools whatsoever. It's a book review of somebody else and else's book on um, Trent, uh, the Trent Gravels of New Jersey in America. So it's nothing to do with it at all. There is no evidence of Smith Woodward being a fan of Elitz. There is no evidence of Smith Woodward being a fan of an organic age of tools. There is no reason really for him being the target of the cricket bat. As I say, in my opinion, the cricket bat makes much more sense for being uh, part of the pre challian concept of the forger and the forger's intent. And I think this idea of a pre-stone uh, organic age of wood and bone was in vogue at that time. This is Dawson's illustrated sketch from the Geological Society proceedings of the cricket bat, as he felt it fitted into the big elephant femur that he thought it had been um, carved out of. Right? This comes from 1914. All right? People were talking about this a lot earlier. Uh, Hazel Dean Warren, a famous uh, archaeologist of the time, this guy, the Reverend Fisher, actually published a whole paper on bone tools of the time, including a small sketch of where he thought this little narrow scoop came from. And he published that in 1912. I think you can see Dawson's getting his ideas from some, um, you know, from basically ether. And I think that's where the forger got the idea from the cricket bat as well. It was being talked about at the time. Even Reed Meyer, his East Anglian pre-Paleolithic, 
got on the bandwagon. A year after, or that's within three or four months of the publication of the cricket bat, he has his own cricket bat found uh, in East Anglia in Ipswich in context of bone tools. A number of people have said that there is clear evidence for this having been discovered before the cricket bat. If you go to the references again, this is an uncritical reuse of references. Fortunately, I didn't say this one this time. Uh, and there is no real evidence. It was basically it was an idea at the time, it was being talked about at the time, and the forgers simply drew on that ethos um, of the age. So, Piltdown, is it out of work? No. Do we know who did it? No. Um, there was uh, a big meeting on the 18th to celebrate the centenary. There have been um, excavations at Piltdown. Uh, they finished yesterday. There's been a big um, research project now. They're looking at DNA on the fossils. Um, a lot of stuff will be uh, revealed, I hope, on the 18th. And new work will be published next year. Piltdown still has an enormous amount to tell us. Trying to figure out who the forger is, is, is to be honest with you, a sideline, because this has got an insight into the practice of science, which is why I think for historians of science and people like myself who are interested in the history of science and the history of human origins research, it's such an important, uh, uh, it's such an important topic, but it's also great fun as well. Um, and on that note, I'll leave it. Thank you very much indeed.